Okay, so we're broadcasting with Steven Alvarez. Uh, right. I just want you to take some time to introduce who you are, where you work, and what kind of research do you do? Sure. Well, um, my name is Steve Alvarez. I'm assistant professor writing rhetoric, digital studies, University of Kentucky. Uh, however, beginning being spring 2017, I'll be assistant professor of English at St. John's University. Okay. It's a new position. Yeah. So, uh, but I come into the, um, the caucus, I guess, since about 2012 when I began my uh, position at Kentucky. So, for a few years, I guess, from both the uh, side of C's and inside from NCPE. Okay. And what kind of research do you do? Uh, my research focuses mostly on language and literacy practices of Mexican immigrants, uh, more specifically branching into homework practices, bilingual practices, and uh, uh, now starting to go into more food and tacos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And where are you originally from? Uh, I'm originally from a place called Safford, S-A-F-F-O-R-D, Safford, Arizona, small town, uh, southeast Arizona. Okay, cool. So the first question I'm going to ask you um, is when did you first attend C's or the NCT because you mentioned that you, you participated both and why that decision? Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, I, it's kind of an interesting case because I got a job first before I attended my first C's. So I had this job uh, already accepted at Kentucky in the same year I was scholar for the dream. Uh, presenting for the first time at C's. So it's a little bit of a weird situation, but uh, as soon as I went to my first uh, C's, however, this was in St. Louis, 2012, and it was there that I found the, uh, the caucus, and I found people who were supportive and were really just able to give me some guidance that I didn't really have in graduate school. So that was the first one for C's, and then ever since then I've been involved in different capacities. And then. Um, with NCTE beginning, I believe, in 2014. Okay. And uh, so when you when you arrived at C's, what 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 did you see? What did you see that you liked? What did you see maybe that you did not like? Um, and we'll get to what draw what drew you in into the caucus in a little bit. But could you answer those two questions? Well, I guess because it's new to me, I couldn't even articulate what it was. <laughs> What the, what the structure of the organization was, what this meant uh, for my career, and how important both the publications are and, and just building a network were. So it was all new to me. What I guess I knew no, or noticed was that I was coming in as an outsider and also that being Latino may or may not have contributed to that. I, I did notice it was a pretty white organization. That would go without saying. Okay. So, okay. Uh, and that was something I was already used to coming out of the English program. But... I, and did feeling as an outsider stem from that presence of whiteness, or did does it, or was there other uh, elements involved in that? Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, at the beginning, I couldn't really say it was even anything with whiteness, but more about just learning how the organization was functioning as, okay. really, just as it was going, as I was going through it, uh, pretty suddenly. So, what I was looking for were people who more or less have maybe have gone through some of these hoops before. Okay. That's where I started speaking to older people uh, in the organization, but specifically older folks in the caucus who reached out to me. So you arrive in St. Louis for the C's. How did, yeah. you, hear, how did you hear about the caucus? I think it was on the program. I was like, I don't know, they, you know, they sent out the, you get the book. Uh, and I was going through the book and it was some of the uh, pre-conference. I think it must have been a pre-conference workshop in the afternoon. Okay. So uh, saw a Latino workshop and just signed up for it. Um, that's where I met folks like Asia Martinez the very, the very first time. Uh, Christina Kirkladder was running it at that time. Yeah. Do you remember why you made the decision to sign up for it, or was just? Uh, you know, it's funny because I guess I saw Latino. I was like, okay. all right, let's get out. <laughs> I was like, didn't see too many others, so I was like, all right, this must be where everybody hangs out. So. <laughs> Did it any way connect to maybe you feeling as an outsider as you arrived with the scene? Well, typically this was something I would never ordinarily have done anyway. Uh, going out to groups that were sort of for Latinos was something, I think maybe uh, it was something I never really had even thought about exploring, uh, either okay. as a professional 
or even really what it meant to be to have a community. But I did see that here's an identity that intersects with some of my own interests and also even my research. So I thought, well, let me go maybe try to network with people. Um, okay. Turned out to be that it was um, really a, a lot more mixture of junior faculty and, and graduate students. So kind of cool. But I think probably not knowing anybody and seeing that I saw Latino in the uh, workshop title thought, well, yeah. this could be a welcome space. Okay. And, you know, that was my first time at SEAS as well. It was an interesting sure. experience. Um, because yeah, you were people talking, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I it was my first time. You know, I was a... I was barely starting my master's program, so it was it was yeah. weird talking in front of a a caucus. Um, but it was a good experience. Um, could you do you remember or do you recall what the sense of importance was when you arrived and joined and participated in that evening caucus uh, workshop? Well, for me, because I you know I had never experienced it before, so it was all very new. And then come to find out from people later on, it was basically the same, <laughs> the same routine. It was happening over and over every year. That <laughs> um, it was sort of, sort of just a small informal roundtable and, and sort of informally people making complaints about the job market and yeah. different things like this. Maybe about uh, different encounters of racism and things on the program and, and different things like this. Stuff that was just new to me. So. For me, it was it was interesting because I had never really been around Latinos in grad school, at least not in English studies. Yeah, so that's cool. People who are also serious about teaching. Yeah, um, so that, was, that was pretty fun. But I think it was uh, new for me because I got to see uh, graduate students, junior faculty. But later on, I come to find out that it was basically the same thing that was happening year after year. So I think as I learned more about the program and also the um, the caucus, I could see with different eyes. But the first time, I mean, it was pretty cool to just see so many people. And do you remember some of the goals that you know were discussed at that at that workshop? Some of the visions you mentioned. You know, people were talking about racism a little bit, about teaching. And I remember Isabel Baca came in. She was talking about you know the the community outreach programs that she works yeah. with. So, what were some of the goals that you they that you, you know, took up on your own in your own research, and that really informed, you know, informs what you do. Well, I did notice, for example, that like, Isabel was presenting. On, um, I guess it was kind of community uh, community service service learning kind of research. I guess bilingual communities where you know where she was located. Yeah. Uh, and then also. What I thought it was pretty cool. I remember Christina Kirkwater was showing a book that she had been one of the editors or editing caucus. This was us who came together to do this kind of project and then tell a little bit more about the history. I didn't know a lot of the stuff. So it was all, like I said, very new. And then meeting people who had just got jobs, who were talking about the market, um, to get my experience with that. I remember, I think that same time Asia had just got a job. So she was able to talk about it. Her going on the market, and I had very similar experiences. It was it was pretty cool, um, just because it was informal, but also was giving us some professionalization. And it gave me some some sense that this was um, something that was important as a space. Yeah, people to know each other. And then how how that worked in my research, though, I think I was already coming into doing stuff with community. So when I saw that this was about building community in a different kind of way, I could see that well, my research here could be valued. I think I saw that probably more uh, with relation to NCTE, which at that time I didn't even know the difference between the two groups. <laughs> yeah. I figured out that it was like, you know, if you do K through 12, you maybe get more NCTE. Um, but that's stuff I learned about later on. So would you say then that as you participated in, in your first workshop that you gained maybe a sense that the caucus was about a community, about a collective voice, or was it individual voices no, i think i think as far as i could tell it was about always i remember um kirk would always talk about buena gente all the time <laughs> it was always about people good people so i think it was always for me the sense that it was um up to the, um, the collective to make it what it was or what it is i didn't know a lot about the history but then of course at different times there have been different leaders who have come and gone and you know 
and I don't know, the organization changes with leadership as well and things like this. But as far as I knew at the time, it was always about a group of people who were basically all volunteers. Yeah. And you know, Octavia takes up that idea of when I hint it. What, is, what does that mean to you? What's that? I said, Octavio, he takes up that idea yeah. of when I enter in his scholarship. So oh. what does that mean? What does that mean to you in relation to your scholarship, in relation to the caucus? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess in some ways it got me to think about how, who's reading my scholarship. And then, you know, especially I think when we started collecting our own um, citations of each other. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff that was got me to think about well, we're not being heard even in terms of conference proposals. Okay. Uh, a lot of the sort of checks in play to really keep the organization on its toes. Um, uh, to really, I mean, they really have an organized voice of dissent uh, with, along with the Black Caucus to really, you know, kind of um, put, I don't know, put our, the issues that affect us in the context and also even have our voices be represented in some of the leadership capacities. So on the one hand, I think that's more about the administration of the organization. How that ties our scholarship is really it's the channels that once you get inside the organization, it doesn't even matter if you're not even a very great scholar, I would say, but being part of the organization opens up channels to be heard more and to have uh, an active voice in the way the way things are run. So. I think somebody that I really admire that's come through uh, the caucus has is, is been Juan Guerra and a lot of the stuff that he's done in terms of um, being back to some of the younger scholars, especially through NCTE. Uh, so he always, I think, had his research, which dealt with teaching, be a part of uh, giving back to younger members as a mentor. So I think if anything, it's, it's looking at some of those folks who've been able to bridge those research um, interests and also some of their activism have been kind of you know, pretty inspiring. Did you gain a sense of that activism in, at your first workshop? Well, that one, not really. I didn't really know. Like I said, I think I, I heard more just about getting to know people. And I think um, I remember they had mentioned about NCTE previously. That they had done some kind of event where they had brought students mm -hmm. to the, I don't know, some kind of, uh, well, I guess what I found out later was the cultural event, um, I guess. Yeah. So, that sounded really cool. I was wondering why we weren't doing a lot of that at our caucus meeting because it was basically just you know, a group of uh, scholars. So I had heard about you know thinking about stuff like that with NCTE, but then later on I found out because they're they're slightly different um, and there's also different funding. Yeah. But, uh, you know, as far as I saw that the first one for four C's, I was thinking, well, we, we say a lot of stuff about community, but for this one, I didn't really see a lot of community voices. Yeah. So in the conversation out in the caucus, how do you think they translate over to the actual national organization of the C's and the NCTD and their way of being responsive to Latino scholars and other educators of color? Well, I guess I like to think that the caucus, you know, we push back on what could easily be um, conversations that get pushed off as being I don't know, overly politically correct or being too touchy about certain things. Um, but I, I would say that, for example, uh, like at the last NCTE, the Black Caucus and the uh, Latino Caucus teamed up to speak out about a few, I guess, issues that were related. Uh, to, to see that kind of stuff happen is, is interesting because it actually pushes back on the organization. But I think there's a long way to go still. Um, and I think probably, if anything, we're seeing more people get elected to different positions, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. So it's the, the face of the organization is changing, but um, if anything, this gives us a space to, to strategize uh, as a community and also support each other. So I think, if anything, we're getting better about how to play the game, especially as we become more members become part of the institution and learn how the game functions and how it's been excluding us for many years. So, in many ways, then, you could say that the NCT and C's has a way of pushing back, but that the collective voice represented, whether through the Latino caucus or the Black caucus, at the same time is pushing back as well. So then, would you say... Yeah, 
Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Would you say then that the caucus is, is a necessary aspect of the actual NCT NCs? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it has to be, it, it's, there are some issues where I guess in the sense of um, further intersections among different caucuses. So even to the point of meeting times and meeting times that conflict and maybe some people make argument about these silos that I don't communicate. But I think what you start to see really is um, the caucuses having at least one collective that's a part of a larger network that, you know, we have interests that we share. And I think there's also the shared interest for social justice across all caucuses, regardless. So if anything, it's um, important only because the issues that affect the Latinos are, are, are unique. And not only just for our research, but also for who we are as, as members of the organization and the future of the organization. And also really just if, coming back to the students of, of the classrooms and the changing demographic of students in the country. So our voices and our research matter. And proportionally, wouldn't you say that, you know, the Latino voice, the student needs and demands overwhelmingly have been marginalized, if not excluded as a whole, from the actual conversations that are going on? Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I think um, especially during times of um, so the political situation we're in right now, and the dehumanizing rhetoric of immigrants. Further, uh, so the, the, the connection with charter schools mm -hmm. and this sort of individualized sense that failure is your own fault and success is your own fault as well, looking away from some of the social contextual issues that affect students and create inequality. So I think this happens at all levels. And I think especially for many of us who are PhD students who become professors, I mean, the odds have been highly stacked. And it's not that any of us are, are supremely special. We just have different opportunities. But it's also remember um, we need to get back and also be aware of the communities around us that we're, we make an impact, uh, both as teachers, but also as, as just voices to speak about some of these inequalities, uh, which other people don't always experience. Okay. So on the line of giving back, um, can you talk about then the the relationship between publication and mentoring and and the role of the caucus? Yeah, this is something I think um, as I've been a part of it, I've known, I've grown to see um, a lot more that this has been the publication network and also publication just assistance of older folks who've gone through some of these hoops with newer folks coming at grad school, graduate students. It's, it's always been there. Um, somebody like, for example, Jaime Mejia gave me a lot of help, a lot of feedback, a lot of introductions to people, publishers. Um, I mean, it's been very helpful you know, to have colleagues who are um, not obliged, I guess, to share the information, but who really want to share the information to help us succeed. Mm -hmm. So that, that also happens, I think, with even uh, graduate students who are further along the line with younger graduate students. I mean, it just really seems very helpful in the sense where um, people are willing to share some of that knowledge. And unfortunately, again, this is stuff that for me, I never really had in my program. So and I wish I would have been a part of the caucus earlier because it probably would have helped me a lot going into um, as a professor. But as a young professor, it was definitely very helpful because that's where I got to meet lots of um, colleagues across the country and who were also able to speak about some similar things that they experienced as the junior faculty. And you, went, and you mentioned Juan Guerra, and you mentioned Jaime Mejia. Are these some of the leaders that you see of the caucus um, that help propel the caucus as it moves forward? Yeah, well, I mean, I give the example of, of let's say, Jaime and, and even Christina Kirkleiter. Um, those, they were, well, Christina, especially because she was chair of the caucus when I first uh, started. Uh, her and Renee Moreno, so I, I knew them pretty okay, but really somebody I got to know better was Juan Guerra, uh, partly because of the CMV program, Cultivating New Voices, where several of the members of our caucus have gone through this. And pairing a, a, a uh, advanced graduate students and junior faculty with a mentor, a seasoned mentor. So Juan was in charge of this, and <clears throat> many of the pe people who have passed through this program have gone on to um, administrative positions in the organization. 
So it's been a really important program, really, I mean, just huge in terms of diversifying the organization. So I saw that happening in CTE. For Cs, I started seeing more uh, a turn towards community when we started doing our workshops. Um, and then I think what I really started to see were, were people coming together in Accessi Milaness. And I started uh, researching the history who were just incredible about doing things like newsletters <clears throat> and just doing a lot of work to keep people connected. So it was really cool, especially to start seeing when I started doing a little bit of the history to different people who really stepped it up. So, you know, when I first came into it, the people who really reached out to me were, were Jaime, Christina, and Juan. So, but it could have been at a different time, Ceci or, or any number of people who just would have been there yeah. that day. And you, you for a moment took on the role as co-chair, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's, well, let's see, it's kind of complicated, but basically my understanding was Christina was going to step away. So there was no real time to do an election. So I was presented with the opportunity to be the interim, interim yeah. <laughs> co-chair. So I said, well, okay, that's fine. But we want to make sure that we have an election uh, in terms of, as an organization, choosing who would do this. So at that same time, I think uh, Renee passed leadership on to, um, she passed leadership on as well. I think, I'm, I'm not sure at that time who would, it might have been. Well, at the same time, yeah, it was, I wasn't sure if it was Tracy or Sandra or if it was together, but it might have been them. I think it might have been Tracy first and then Sandra, so then they became co chairs. Mm -hmm. So then for a little while, it was, I was hanging out with Sandra and Tracy, and we would do just sort of these conversations where we started talking about vision of the, uh, of the organization. Mm -hmm. But uh, I stepped aside to step out because I had to do with like tenure, and writing a book, and uh, Raul was, was interested. So, I mean, actually, at that, at that time, I would just basically put up for the air anyone who wanted to take on the position. So, since there was already a co-chair on one side, we did co-chair on the other side, and we did just this uh, general election. <laughs> so, I, did my, I guess I did my job as interim. I guess it was interesting because I do regret that as Christina was moving on, that there were no folks who were senior scholars who wanted to step up mm -hmm. and take the position. Uh, there were several of us junior scholars who were still you know, a few years in. Uh, Asia, I'm thinking of specifically, who said we would do it together, her and I. And I was thinking, well, you know, this is only like my third C's. I don't really know what's going on. But I said, well, you know, I can learn too. But really, no one decided to sort of step in and say, this is what I want to do. or take the leadership. Somebody who's already tenured, basically. Yeah. So it was kind of a weird position. So I, I said I would take it on, but it was more like, well, until somebody who knows what's going on, will take it on. So I'm glad you chose as a caucus. And at that time, I think Tracy and Sandra had some really interesting stuff going on in terms of rewriting the some of the guidelines and building some bridges. So yeah. It looked like things were going in its good place. Cool. Um, OK, so. We're almost done with the interview. I have a couple more questions. Um, sure. But what is a story that you would like to tell about the caucus? You've talked about community, you've talked about a little bit of networking, uh, collective voices pushing against you know, the organization. Mm -hmm. But what, what is a story you would like to tell about the caucus? I guess the caucus in general, the story would be one of, um, I don't know, it's like any other story, it has its ups and downs. I don't want to say the heroes and villains. Everyone's heroes. <laughs> but it has different personalities. And there have okay. been, I guess, like any or, any party or any caucus, there have been clashes and, and, and outlooks or ideologies. And especially from people who are, I don't know, who study argumentation. Lots of debates. But yeah. I think all for the best of, of keeping the organization forward. So I think anything more, um, we're starting to see more collaboration between NCTE and 4Cs, which is important because I think we'll be one of the only caucuses, aside from even the Black Caucus, who has that kind of collaboration, which is important because that'll connect us also further with K-12. through So yeah. it seems really cool, a cool moment, especially with so many people who are coming up as PhD students and finding jobs and, and uh, becoming part of the organization. It's It seems really exciting. Uh, for a long time, it was always just Victor Villanueva 
<laughs> we're talking about Latino scholars, and now there's more voices and more people being recognized as not even just Latino scholars, but as major voices in the field. So yeah, it's pretty exciting. Okay. And how would you like others to remember the caucus? I think they, uh, it's, it's important for others, uh, just people to know who we are. So if they remember us at all, that's perfect. <laughs> but if anything, they can remember that this was a, um, a group of scholars who organized themselves and who had a vision or share a vision, but as a way to uh, give back to each other. Um, because so much of this kind of work can be um, isolation, isolationist or isolated, I should say. And it can be a lot of backbiting and also competition among even really good friends. Yeah. So I can say the caucus has been really cool because it breaks down a lot of those um, smoke screens, I guess, that we don't always see that competition. But more important, it helps us see opportunities to help each other. And the yeah. caucus, if anything else, I mean, people publishing together, doing books, uh, collaborations, research, writing. I mean, it's, it's, if anything, I can say we're seeing more of that happen. I think maybe also, you know, the way we're using social media is a lot more savvy than some of the other caucus groups. So it's really cool to see where we're going in the future. Yeah, and and you know the 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 motivation for this for this project really stemmed out uh, out of a course I took in the first year of my PhD, and you know we were looking at the history of the Black Caucus, and we read you know chapters from listening to our elders, and I really noticed. Uh, how there's little to no documentation of the emergence of the caucus, the founding members, and just until recently, like 2011, um, there has been little to no acknowledgement of those founding members. And so basically my last question for you is, why do you think then the history of the caucus is important? Well, it's funny because I didn't really know a lot of the history until so I was in an intern position with uh, Tracy and Sandra because so we were trying to try to read the, uh, the newsletter. newsletter. Mm -hmm. So we found, so we found, found all from Ceci. From Ceci. And it was, and it was wow. wow. There were like recipes, poems, uh, various accomplishments, people's birthdays. It was pretty cool. And she yeah. had done this like basically once every month or every couple of months and it was like mass mail folded like really pretty pretty cool um but just the the amount of time that she took to do this to really i mean it was pretty pretty important i think it was important for keeping people together so seeing that and seeing those i mean some of them were pretty old they were like 15 years old i think we i think uh tracy and sandra archived a lot of them saved them as pdfs so um seeing those was really cool because it showed me uh, from the very beginning, it was a smaller group of people with the same interests. And then for me, especially when we have our different get-togethers every year, we see how the rooms are getting bigger and bigger, like smaller is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's really cool to see uh, the community grow. And then I think it's even more important to really start thinking about the kind of diversity of Latino voices and Lat Lat Latinx <laughs> that we're also having to learn about amongst ourselves. So. A lot more cool debates about what the identity means and then also I think especially moving into the future in the direction that we want to see the organization move. Okay. Is there any question that I left out that you think I should ask? No man, I think we're good. <laughs> so we got a lot of work. Yeah. Hey, so thank you again, Stephen, for joining us today. Um, answering, you know, right, several questions and contributing to this documentation of the Latino caucus history. I really cool. appreciate it. All right, man. Cool. Take care. Let me know how it works or if I can help out with anything else. I will. Take care, man. All right. Take care. See you. My bougie